Right on. This is the reason for the season. Uh, real quick, a lot of people have done some amazing stuff. Uh, last night was a really good time. So um, this is going to be really exciting. And uh, a lot of hard work these people did. And so just real quick, yeah, definitely, right? A day and a half. Exactly. So, so this is what can be built in about 15 hours, right? You know, if then or longer, well, 20, 20 something. So, anyways, all right. So, take it away, Daniel. All right. Well, I'm going to start out with Amir here. Okay, Amir's taking it away. Okay. Should I start? Yep. Okay. So, uh, the project that we uh, worked on is immersive project management data visualization with game engine integration. Can you go to that? So we are a SDV uh, company, from, uh, mostly active in New York and the East Coast, and with the Penn State uh, graduate students, and we work on that project together, and uh, you can see the guys here. And uh, the reason we work on this project is that there are challenges in construction industry which are very important. As one of the reports said, there is a declining in productivity in construction sector. If you look at different uh, trends, in different industries, you see that construction is uh, declining, unfortunately. And we have islands of information and many different problems. And I think in BIM, we can help that. And uh, so how we can help, the, help this um, construction industry from the decline in productivity would be, uh, we think, uh, better data flow, better communication, easier access to complex data, and integration of ex existing software. And uh, why we picked this hack was because project management is going to be, uh, is the center of every kind of data uh, things we have. And this is a center. So c scope, time, cost, risk, and everything can be managed through project management. And changes and claims and legal things are based on this. And gaming engine or game engine is very important because you can get valuable graphics, data, better walkthroughs, or you, know, you can uh, actually have better interactions with human beings. And uh, one of the other advantages that we thought was uh, you can publish uh, your virtual reality models into the web so, so that you can uh, people can actually access data better and easier. So um, basically, what we did here uh, was um, we started the scheduling with um, Primavera P6, and we used Autodesk um, Navisworks in order to cost load the schedule and also do the BIM object assignments. Then we exported, using used the, the Navisworks API to export the data uh, through the, uh, for, for the schedule, uh, schedule and cost and different project data to a format that could be readable by Unity. And using Unity, um, we worked on the uh, you know, an FBX file, and we worked Unity uh, script. And uh, finally, we, we could publish, actually, the augmented reality model to uh, the web, and also using Oculus Rift. That, uh, uh, actually, Daniel will talk about it in, in the future, shortly. And this, these are some screenshots from the Navisports and also the schedule. And uh, I will let Daniel talk about the Unity and uh, virtual reality parts. All right, and so for the virtual reality part, we'll, let's go ahead and just load that up really quick. If you could actually go ahead and hold that for me. Yeah. So the basics of it are, of course, simple. You have your headset. You can start wandering around, walking around. You'll excuse the fact that, ooh, no, actually this is working better than it was a few minutes ago. So. So excuse me one second while I go to our project site. Then as we're walking through, we can start visualizing what's happening in different areas. So we can slide through the time. We can see what the cost is being at different points. We can see things as they're constructed. And as they go through, fade out, the new things fade in and go from one part quickly skim backwards, forwards, and move our way through. So having it in here is, is nice. Being able to visualize, and we did have to change a few things because we realized, you know, there are ways to make things in here that can make you very uncomfortable being in VR. And I'm not talking sick, but just having something be built around you and moving at you in space, that can be a very interesting experience. We, a lot of this though, and good, you can, can read it there. 
is just being able to get all of the data into a format that's easily transferable, easily understandable. Any person could put this on and really visualize what's happening in this space. By having it in Unity as well, this also means if we want to put it onto a website and say, go log on here and walk around the site, it's done. As he also mentioned, Android or iOS. If we want to take this, pop it into augmented reality, sadly we're about five minutes away from having that app actually running, so have to apologize for that part. But the same sort of thing. Click of a button, it goes out, and you have it in another format. All of these ways, because of the fact that we have this hack that pushes the data from Primavera, from Navisworks, and into Unity. Switching out of here and going back into... So yes, there, some of the overview of what that building is from the top down, and then some of what you've just seen. So um, if you go to the next slide. So there are some future work that can be done with this. Um, we just brought cost and time data to Unity, and uh, it could be published on web. You don't need any software if a uh, general audience want, wants to have, have a look at those, uh, that model can be done. And there are a lot of things in cloud-based project management that we, we, need, we can connect a uh, Unity model to uh, web services and databases, and then we can have real-time uh, multi-user timeline simulation and also um, uh, visualizing more uh, project management data basically in Unity model. Yep, these are the future works that can be done. And that is our hack. Are there any questions? Next. Okay, actually for uh, any questions, there aren't gonna be any, so Steve, hand down. All right, um, <laughs> so uh, thank you uh, for, for the first round. Awesome. you're asking um, okay yeah so if you do have any questions though for any of the teams just find them afterwards guys uh, we're gonna try to, to roll through here uh, yeah so uh, up next we have uh, build group awesome all right guys take it away hey uh, my name is Ambert and this is my brother Lucas uh, we're very grateful to the organizers for this opportunity to get exposure to the AEC industry as well as um, the opportunity to attend our first hackathon so on Friday, we met the uh, nice folks who uh, built a smart window and brought that over. Um, we thought that uh, it would be a very interesting piece of equipment to be a part of a larger intelligent home automation system. Um, hopefully not a malicious one like in the movies. And we decided to build a fun little app uh, that is a, a smart alarm. And uh, without further ado, I'll hand this over to uh, Lucas. So the gist of our smart alarm and the motive is that we want a smoother wake-up experience for the end user. With traditional alarm clocks, they're based on sound. Sleep inertia is a big problem because alarm clocks typically, when you set a time, it wakes you up at that time regardless of what sleep state you're in. So an example might be if you're in very deep sleep at the moment, then if you're woken up at that time, you're going to be very groggy at you're going to be very groggy at wake up. And there have been experiments that have shown that the grogginess you get from sleep inertia is worse than that from intoxication. And if you're, if you're getting in a car on a commute after that, then you can imagine it's being a safety issue as well. But meanwhile, if you use light to wake up, then the light will naturally enter in your eyes and your body through your eyelids, which will trigger your body's wake up cycle. And then when the, time, when, the, when the time comes, the body will wake up naturally. So that's a smoother wake up. And also, as Ambert said, we wanted to play with a smart window and the Philips Hue light bulb APIs for the Internet of Things to improve our built environment. And the built environment is the human-made space in which people live, work, and recreate on a day-to-day -day basis. So we're focusing on the live and day-to-day -day part. So it's so we're trying to, in, fa in fact, make a smarter home that makes the day-to-day -day experience more, more smooth. So our app basics is that it's a JavaScript and jQuery front end with a Rails backend server. And our Bootstrap-inspired layout was from bootstrapcdn.com. And we also had a time picker plugin. So I'm going to talk about the workflow right now. So the workflow is that the user selects a time they would like to wake up. And then when that time comes in our app, the app is going to query the smart sensor over there. And then if it'll 
get the brightness level of what's of the light outside. And if it's very bright outside, the shade is going to be lifted. And this assumes that the user beforehand has shut down the sh shut down the shade. And if it's dark outside, it's going to revert to the the reverts of Philips Hue light is it's going to it's going to wake up by turning on the Philips Hue light bulb and we found in the API that there's a capability to set a color loop effect so it basically cycles through all the Roy G Biv colors and it'll wake up the user that way so here's our demo and here we we also change the code so that if you enter in a time right now in this demo it's going to trigger right away because we don't want to keep you all waiting the whole time so when you press enter, the turn over there. Let's see if the rail server is actually up. Um, oh, so we have to turn on and what? Let me refresh the page. The curse of the live demo, man. It's okay. <laughs> PM. Let's look at the code. Um, since it's less than 100, which Wi-Fi network are we on? How do you switch to Wi-Fi? Don't change that code. Oh, we're trying to connect the right Wi-Fi, because we need to be in the correct yeah. Wi-Fi network. <laughs> OK, yeah. We weren't on it before, so now we are. Let's try that again. Refresh. And wait, it was working before. Oh, it's still loading. That's okay, you guys have a minute and 24 left, so. <laughs> oh, the light just went on. <laughs> and it's gonna right. go, and you can, see the, you can see the cycle right now. And we can also, if the, we can also have another configuration whereby if we set the threshold lower, it's going to raise that smart window. But since we're not allowed to change the code, we can't really demonstrate that right now. But so this, this shows how configurable our app is, that if the user s prefers a certain, a certain lighting level to wake up, they can easily configure maybe in the future how many, how much power they want. So we also have more things to say about future work. Yeah, so as, as um, we mentioned previously, uh, we saw this as part of a broader home automation platform. And there are things like uh, cameras for presence detection, um, beyond security solutions, also for measuring room, room occupancy. Uh, also, window tinting, for example, if this was deployed in a commercial environment, you could imagine uh, a mobile website or a mobile app, app that uh, was brought up and upon entering a room or leaving it, you could raise or lower the shades for presentations. And also angle the shades for uh, tracking sun um, and also uh, adjusting luminescence inside. And our code's available at this link right here. And thank you guys very much for giving us this chance. Okay, so next up on deck, uh, okay, we have the next team that's uh, coming up, and so uh, Hack E, correct? Yes? 
Yep, that's right. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, All go right. ahead and get started. How's it going, guys? Um, so we built a uh, autonomous sensor reading data car, and um, Jeremy here's going to kind of show off a little demo that we ran. I'm just kind of running in a straight line. So uh, once you get that going, do you want to explain what's going on here? So right now, this little robot uh, we nicknamed Hacky, he is set to semi-autonomous. He's been set on this path to go that direction, and um, he's reading the temperature data as he goes along, and as his wheels are spinning, um, he uses an Arduino microcontroller uh, to control his path and the sensor values. And so, uh, he's over here right now, but, and he's coming back. Um, he uses, uh, when he's in full autonomous mode, he uses a ping ultrasonic sensor to keep himself out of harm's way. He's robust, um, and this has many uh, applications on a job site that I'll hand over to you to explain. All right, great. So um, for this hack, we were able to get some data out of it. And um, what we did for, um, just for prototyping purposes, we pushed this, uh, this wireless controller to um, a Google Doc. And I don't know if some um, you guys are familiar with Grasshopper. But we pushed this into a grasshopper doc. This is the room right here. It's kind of the route he just ran. And um, so you can see these kind of very temp temperature data. And uh, let me just play this. This is just kind of a demo here. But um, you know, as it goes back and forth, um, you know, line by line, it can pick up you know, with pretty ac um, accurate measurements temperature data, humidity data, whatever sort of sensor you want to put on this thing. So, it could be the size of this room, it could be the size of a large warehouse, and um, it could really create a digital map of the space um, without really having to go out and read it um, yourself with some sort of device. So, you hand it over to Jeremy to kind of explain the, the longer term approach to this. Yeah, so um, with, with this um, autonomous car, you can um, load it up, it can solve a number of problems. and. Okay, so um, into, into this machine, you'd be able to load a BIM model of your site so that the car could have sensory data on it and it would know where it is on your project site. Um, and therefore, it would be able to you know, send all of this information back to the contractor and the architect to give them information. Also, once the project is complete, um, this machine would still be able to um, essentially roam throughout your building and give you updated information as to how your building is performing and give you um, graphs and visualizations. Um, okay. Do you want to add anything? To that? <laughs> yeah. So we um, also wanted to use augmented reality so that a... Um, a facilities manager would be able to go into a room and see the um, kind of the artifacts of uh, temperature throughout uh, Hacky's like travels. So you could walk into a room, you could look at areas that were underperforming, and um, you could easily assess them versus like a static on the wall system that uh, you typically find in building automation systems. Um, and so. We also wanted to kind of, as like kind of a future uh, kind of thought with this, was the ability to project on the wall with Hacky's um, uh, projector um, BIM data. So we would have uh, artifacts within the wall that we could use kind of, uh, what was the term? The, uh, data light. the data light. And so you would be able to look at the wall and kind of have an x-ray vision of historical information that has been scanned by Hacky throughout the construction process so that you could um, easily get into the wall without having to um, ex do exploration uh, kind of con demo. Um, and then we have like kind of the AR aspect of it we could show you. Um, can you just pull up the... Okay, so this is what Hacky sees. sees. <laughs> 
And um, this would be, this is a visualization of what Hacky um, would produce like as a data set initially. And um, so then you'd be able to see the entire, uh, this would be like an artifact that you could come in later and say, well, you know, certain areas are uh, performing optimally or not optimally. And this would be like the entire room scan. So it's kind of like a, um, a uh, computational fluid dynamic uh, um, model, but then it's not necessarily, um, it's actually recorded data that you could look at through an augmented device. That's good. Yeah. Um, so let's show the, um, so this is the open source stuff that we use. We use Arduino, Firefly, which hooks up with uh, Grasshopper, Google Docs and Google Apps uh, kind of stuff. And uh, we also used ArchiCAD, Cinema 4T, uh, Matayo. Um, and we were just having a little bit of trouble um, with Matayo, but this is, this is a, a miniature version of what a uh, operator or a facilities manager would see. Uh, so it'd be like that, and you would just see that through augmentation. Um, so that would be kind of where we're going with that. And so the benefit that we thought to having this information projected um, through the robot or through a handheld device, which would be a part of that, is that it wouldn't eliminate the need for glasses and you would have sort of like a robust um, uh, device that you could use. And we were also thinking for security purposes, for on-site security, that uh, oh, Hacky could go around side. and um, uh, analyze the site should uh, the typical security measures uh, be overridden, uh, which is, uh, I guess, an issue now on construction sites. Thanks. All right, thank you. All right awesome. Yeah. Okay. We're team Hack My Hard Hat, and my name is Brett Young. Uh, you can follow along on our presentation at www.hackmyhardhat.com. Um, I'm going to pass the mic to left and have each of our team introduce uh, who they are and what they did in the project. My name is Mark Decker, Hunt Construction Group, and I stitched together a video for this, kind of demonstrating what we're trying to accomplish. Hi, my name is Sridhar Baldava. I'm with Walter P. Moore Engineering and Associates, and uh, what I did f for this project is basically cre create a Python script that's recording all this data locally and trying to send out to the server my name is Ben Bushman, I'm from Integral Group, and I did the hardware soldering and circuits and electronics. Okay, we have a short video um, to kind of describe what we're doing, and we have some very generic music as well. Uh, so overall, you know, the, the hard hat is ubiquitous on all job sites, and the overall construction industry is absolutely huge. In the U.S. alone, it's over close to a trillion dollars. Um, and if you can make a small incremental change, uh, you have an impact to, you have the ability to make an impact on a lot of people. We tried to make the technology very unobtrusive, um, and so we're running a Linux computer inside of the hard hat with uh, two humidity and temperature sensors, and then a uh, camera, five megapixel camera coming out the front. Um, the example that we wanted to provide was a safety example where you have a uh, electrician, for example, uh, walking around and the hard hat is made self-aware either through QR codes or through um, the iBeacon type of concept. And then that you have um, supervision, in this case a foreman, and that overall what we're trying to do is have the foreman be more aware of uh, the health and the exertion level of the people who are around them. So the information is dashboarded up onto in the trailer or on another device. And uh, when a person has a heat stress um, action, they become peaked, they'll be notified, and uh, the overall awareness people can go and, and, and help that person 
um, either by having them rest or by giving them a bottle of water, for example. Um, another example would be if you add an accelerometer to the hat, you could tell if a person was immobile, and then you could go and help them out. Does that look like space balls or what, huh? Big hat. So, uh, overall, you know, the goal again is that we're trying to raise the awareness of uh, the workers and workers' health so that it's known across the entire job site. And we're doing that through uh, wearable technology. And um, that's kind of the, the overall, you know, the implementation, this particular implementation of, of wearable tech um, to what we did. And special thanks to Sherry and Sabrina for um, being a part of the uh, acting. So uh, if you look at the website, hackmyhardhat.com, um, there's a synopsis of kind of what we, how we built it. Um, it's a Raspberry Pi computer, roughly equivalent to an iPhone 4, or somewhere in between iPhone 4 and iPhone, iPhone 3. Um, there are two humidity sensors, one inside of the hat and one on the back of the hat, uh, with the goal of being able to measure the difference between the two, so that if it's simply hot out, that um, you'd be able to look at whether or not there's exertion within the hat creating heat and, and they're, they're under stress. Um, there's a Wi-Fi dongle attached to it. And then all that data is then pushed up to the web into a database, and then um, it's dynamically graphed. So the hard hats we have up here are currently uh, Wi-Fi connected and logging data to the web. And we could look at, in particular, at Ben's hat and see if it's hotter than uh, any other hat, or, if, or number two, or if it's hotter than the hat that's lying on the table. Um, so again, you're, you're plotting four things, uh, worker temp, ambient temp, worker relative humidity, and then uh, ambient relative humidity. Um, and so we're doing that for all three workers, and it refreshes whenever you refresh the page. And um, then down here on the bottom, you can see that we're capturing images, and the web page is capturing the last image uh, that was uploaded. Uh, so there's one hard hat probably lying on the table back there. Um, but um, And if we refresh the page conceivably, You can see the changes in the in the uh, in the images as they, as they go up. Um, so right now we're capturing images. Um, uh, capturing video would be perfectly reasonable and uh, enabled to go do. Um, there are limitations and problems with you know the Wi-Fi about how you how you push that up and how you kind of get that going. Um, but overall, I think we prove that you can take a hard hat, apply commercial off-the-shelf technology, um, apply I don't know 15 times four hours to it and come up with a, um, a, a product that, that is a proof of concept and that actually kind of pushes data up and around. Um, so I think that's the end of our presentation. Thank you. Awesome. Really cool work, guys. All right, so next up we have Izot, is that correct? Izot, yes. Yeah, hi, I'm uh, Rich Blumseth for the uh, Izot LBL team. Uh, so the team consisted of myself and my son, he's not here right now, uh, Christian Kohler and Steven Sarzniski from uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, Joel Hartswell, Hartswell here from Noresco, and Aaron Berman from URS, who has gone home. The challenge we're trying to address, or a few things we're trying to address, one is just the cost of integration of building automation systems. Today, building automation consists of a lot of siloed systems. Each one's very independent of the other. There's ways to integrate them with a lot of work, but you don't, shouldn't have to hack every building to get it working. But today, that's in essence what happens. Another problem we're trying to solve is that blinds aren't operated in a very energy efficient manner today. And blinds can really be used to help make energy usage more efficient within buildings if they were a bit smarter than they were. And the other problem we're looking at is many very automated systems are sometimes too automated, that, that the operators, the users, the occupants of a building don't have enough local control. So the technology we're looking at to solve these problems, first of all, is the Internet of Things. It's really the next big wave in computing. 
you know, computing has gone from mainframes with millions of computers to workgroup computing, where we had hundreds of millions of computers, to co the corporate and consumer internet, where we now have billions of computers. And the next big thing is in the industrial and consumer internet of things, where everything gets automated and there's tens of billions of computers. We can leverage those computers to make buildings smarter and solve these problems. We think the Internet of Things will converge these applications that were previously in separate silos. So just like computer networking used to be siloed applications on mainframes, the Internet brought those together and it allowed us to do amazing new things like the World Wide Web. The same thing will happen with the Internet of Things, where we have these separate systems today in, in buildings, we can bring those systems together. So what's that look like, a converged building? Well, a converged building today you know, has some temperature sensors in it, or will, will have. And in that system, you know, employee can arrive, he can, he can uh, swipe his card as he en enters the building, or him or her, uh, sense the idea of that employee, adjust the office temperature to be comfortable so that by the, employee, by the time the employee gets to their office, it's comfortable. Can start turning lights on on the way to their office as well as within their office. Can get the elevator going. The employee gets the elevator, they get on the elevator because it's there. And finally, they get to their office and everything is good to go. So we think the Internet of Things has a lot to bring. The technology we looked at for our hack was uh, one piece of it was the IZOP platform, which is a new platform being introduced by uh, Echelon Corporation, uh, where I'm from. That's already looking at addressing this trend in the Internet of Things. And one of the things we see in the trend is that many of these systems require different kinds of communication. There's a, you know, a combination of wireless communication and wired communication. And looking at the forecast for Internet of Things, the forecasts going forward are there's going to be a large combination of both wired and wireless. And we think it's very important to have open protocols that can go across the two. So today, Echelon concentrates within buildings, primarily in wired systems. And so out of about 900 million devices in, in that general market, we have about 100 million deployed so far. But we see with the Internet of Things, there's going to be you know, tens of billions of, of things out there. And many of those will be wired, many will be wireless. We want to take advantage of both. So the other technology we're looking at then was then the pieces of the Eyes Up platform, uh, which are chip stacks and modules that go into devices that talk with each other, whether they be wired or wireless, routers that connect these things to web-based applications as well as the web-based applications themselves. And we think the big advantage of this is having a single architecture that can go across all these platforms will lower the cost for manufacturers delivering into smart buildings. The other technology we looked at is some of these low-cost Linux processors that are out there. We've heard some of the other projects using these, too. We use two within our project. We use Raspberry Pis, which are $35 Linux computers, and we also use BeagleBone Blacks, which are $45 Linux computers. Pretty amazing, low-cost platforms, very readily available, very programmable, very hackable. So our application, we had two pieces to it coming in on, on Friday. We had one piece, which was a demonstration application that, that Echelon had developed, which is a simple demonstration uh, lighting system using our, our free uh, software for creating connected devices. So that system was a lighting control system where we have a Raspberry Pi that can read uh, an environmental sensor and report temperature, humidity, and light level and occupancy. Another one that can read a touch keypad so a user can have control of lights. And a third one that actually controls LEDs. All those also interface to a, a web server that has web pages where you can control the lighting system. The guys from Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory had, had built a smart window where they could actually open and close shade. And we, and we already so, saw those shades as part of the smart alarm. What we did for our hack was interface the two. Since these were both IP-based systems, we said, well, we should be able to get these two IP-based systems to talk to each other. That's the beauty of IP, of course. And we did that. And here's the open source software that we use quite a bit. We're using Raspbian, Ubuntu, and Angstrom Linux in, in the various processors, the free stack from Echelon, Python, Python Flask for a web server. BeagleBone I.O., Adafruit Libraries, RESTful APIs, HTML5, and then within our own server stack, we have Django, Nginx, Gunicorn, and SQLite. So with that, I'll give you a quick demo, and let's see if it all works. So this is the web page that, that um, the web page interfacing to the system, 
And right now, you see the lights are on over there. We see the shades are down. So if I say, let's turn the lights off, hopefully if we don't have demo problems, uh, but we might have demo problems. I might not be connected, just like the last one was. Yeah, so I'm getting an error down here at the bottom. That's not a good sign when, when you get errors. Let's see if I'm on the wrong channel, too. Is it demo five? That should be the right one. Well, I'm getting demos, but let's see if we do it the, the old-fashioned hard way, which is go hit the keypad, turn the light off here, and if we're lucky, the blinds go up or down. Well, we lost our connection to the blinds, it looks like. So we did have it working earlier. You take a word for it. <laughs> the two systems were talking very, very nicely, so we could control lights here. Then we went over there and, and actually were able to toggle the blinds. But my time's up, so come by afterwards if you actually want to see them working. Oh, there they go. Hey, hey just some time. All right. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you. Awesome. All right, and next up, Peter. I'm Peter Zoll. I work at Autodesk. Um, we have a new product that does model-based scheduling. For those of you who aren't familiar with what exactly that means, it's taking the traditional numbers and dates and merging them with thousands or tens of thousands of large drawings and trying to make sense of that in a connected manner. As some of you have... Oh. Uh, tango, I think is what we call it. The team is me. But um, some of you who've been around the biz for a while may know that the true secret to writing executive dashboards is that they have to resemble breakfast cereal. The reason that's true is you always want to use small words, simple sentences, large fonts and bright colors. And the key part is you want to charge a lot of money. We don't do things quite that way. We have a lot more democratic way of looking at how you do dashboards. So our intent is to let anyone use a dashboard from either a foreman or even an individual worker on the floor to the proverbial executive who thinks he knows what he's reading when he sees our stuff. In our case, uh, what we wanted to do was be fairly flexible. So one of the things we let you do is configure how you want the dashboard to work. In the thrilling world of scheduling, there's a whole ton of dates, so we let you pick them. The danger for me as a coder in this uh, jungle is that our app allows you to define custom fields. I curse this most days and usually even more on weekends. So what we let you do here is pick all the dates that you'd like to see exhibited. In scheduling, for those of you who have suffered through it, there are tons of different float calculations. Float tells you as a manager or a foreman how much freedom you have to move an activity forward or backward in time and sometimes also in space. We're okay. Um, the next thing that um, proved to be a real thorn in my side here, and it's not Facebook's fault, I like to make that clear, is that we design all parts of our app, or almost all parts of it, so that they're independent of um, the actual cloud that our database is living on. So you wind up, if you're on a job site and you don't have internet connectivity, we have a lazy reader and writer that go back and forth. So you have actually a cached local copy of what it is that you need to get your work done. Theoretically, if you're a foreman out on the job site, what you're looking at is probably a week worth of schedule and it's for your particular function. In the dashboards like this, that's a little wider spread. We're more looking at um, across schedules. And one of the things that distinguishes Tango is we love to go across schedules because we want to level your resources for you if you let us. We also look at your costs if you're interested in that. That's why we let you pick different financial fields that are of interest to you. Everybody always ignores finding out what the profit of a schedule is. I've never seen it in any other software. And I really wonder, because we are a capitalist society, wouldn't you like to know how much money you're actually going to make this time? Apparently, it's not of interest, but Tango actually provides it. The other thing we do is we let you pick a whole bunch of things about how you want your schedules arranged on the screen. So the B 
besides scheduled description, which would be the normal alpha, you can also set um, your strategic priority, which we take as a number. You can also do custom stuff. So if you happen to be a WBS freak, we can let you organize your schedules by which WBS hierarchy they're operating in. So if you're building missiles for a living, that's pretty important. Uh, some of the display parameters let us get around having to look at what size display you have. We will listen as best we can to it, but we also let you tell us how you would like to see this. So for example, the thing that says open all panels, we have uh, six, currently six panels in the hypercube. Instead of making you click through all of them, we can let you open all six of them at once if you have the display space. Some of the other stuff, don't worry about GPU acceleration. It's cool, but uh, that's why we put revert to default in there, because everybody gets in trouble. What we um, do with schedule groups is let you pick out of the universe of schedules. You have to do two things for us, or we'd like you to do two things. One is to pick schedules from your corporation or division or whatever that you're interested in, and that forms the bridge where we're downloading the current stuff because the cloud's continuously updating, and we're sending back requests to the cloud saying, what do you got? So there's a two-way communication if there's internet connectivity. Otherwise, you're gonna get the cache that's on your machine. We'll send you an effective date. We can't always tell in time if you have no connection that the data is good, so there's sort of a, an asterisk, this is as good as we've got. What I had wanted to do um, was color code these dorky schedule names so that uh, in the principle of breakfast cereal for the masses, you could take one glance and if everything's green or white, your board is good. You either have stuff like white as didn't start and green is on time. That's all customizable. We do um, a lot of stuff with what are called philemes. So if you look back at the main menu, what that had on it was pictures and text. What that lets us do is get out of being trapped in English. So all of the text, at, I didn't implement it here, but or I didn't build a Spanish for it, but you can click one place in the app and change the text every place. So if you have a crew that only speaks uh, Russian and they're building stuff for you in Crimea, first of all, we need to talk, but second, um, you can flip the app back and forth. They can key on the picture. They don't actually know, have to know how to read. It helps if they do, but um, it is not strictly necessary, and that's what Philemes by us. These um, are two pictures that are associated with a particular schedule. Architects in the audience, we have anybody who recognizes the bottom image? No. Okay, that's the bent pyramid in Egypt. So it's one of the great engineering failures of all time. It's still standing. Um, it started out looking a little differently than it, the interim shot at the top. What happened was there was a sister pyramid being built. Generally, if you're an architect and the pharaoh, who's God, the richest man and commander of the army, wants a pyramid for his tomb, you build it. What happened on this was the sister pyramid at Madum collapsed and fell, and the architect was killed by being crushed. The second architect, his esteemed replacement, came in and said, we have to change the angle. To this day, mathematicians don't know how he knew to change from 52 degrees to 43, but it's still standing, so we got it right. What we intended to do was go through, oh, come on, click. Oh, whew. Those are nerve-wracking, was go through um, five more panels. I'm out of time, but what the panels show you besides the images are the floats, the dates, the revenue projections, all of those good things. If you want to see the rest of them, I am now officially out of time. I'll be happy to show you. Thanks. Let's bring the next uh, one up to the screen. Okay, we'll get started. We are Project Beacon. And uh, we're going to introduce ourselves real quick, and then we'll dive in. So Eric Davis, Winterton Builders. Hi, I'm Taran Gupta, uh, user experience design. I currently work for Vectra Networks. Hi, I'm Hela Dejani, and I work for Assemble Systems. Will Moyer, Assemble Systems. Eric Law, I'm the founder of VDoc. Shee McKinney, architect with Perkins Will. Jim Balding, architect, The Ant Group. And uh, Eduardo Born, a developer, Assemble Systems. 
And we have two other teammates that aren't here. Nate uh, was also a developer for MEDOC, and then Vidya Thayarajan, who is a Swinerton employee as well. So um, next slide, our problem. We wanted to um, take an ERP system, which is EDOC uh, software, uh, manages project information in general, and we wanted to take uh, Symbol Systems, which is a Revit add-in and a web viewer, uh, to view and look at uh, project or I guess parameter information from a Revit model. Uh, and we wanted to integrate these solutions and try to make the information location aware. So um, this is a, uh, an example of the model that was created uh, in Revit and we just overlaid that with a photograph. And next slide. And then uh, Hal is going to speak to the architecture. Okay, so we have quite a bit of systems integrating. Um, we use some commercial products, such as Assemble Systems, to actually push the data out of Revit, so that way we could extract everything that we needed to give you BIM information about this room. So this room was modeled. All the fixtures were modeled. Amazing, by the way. <laughs> Even the back panel was modeled. So all that information ended up in Revit, and we extracted it using Assemble into a database. That database is on the cloud. So we were able to extract it, but that's a, it for Assemble. We didn't use any of the other utilities. We were able to push the data up into the cloud and, and then have a mobile device that we created. None of us are mobile developers, by the way, so we'll show you <laughs> the open source <laughs> that we used to try to bridge that gap. Um, so what we did was we interacted with the Bluetooth low energy um, device on the Android and with little beacons which are placed <laughs> in this room. Um, the model was divided into three rooms, so this space is divided into three rooms, and what we're going to demonstrate is how, when we're walking around, the phone device will detect which area it's located in, send out a REST request to the service, and get back data, BIM data as well as ERP data. And um, so some of our open source standards, or actually open sources that we used, obviously REST services, I was able to push to an Azure cloud, because I have a free... Um, some free, uh, actually, services there, but we used a service stack uh, for the APIs. PhoneGap, which is an open source, um, I guess it's a wrapper around uh, platforms, mobile platforms, uh, JavaScript libraries, uh, a ton of them. <laughs> and with that, we'll start with the demo. All right, so she's going to follow me around here so y'all can actually see what uh, my phone is doing here. So we, uh, we did it on an Android device. Um, hopefully you are getting it correct. Um, so what I'll do here is you might uh, be near one of our beacons. Um, do not move them. Um, so we did have to uh, know in the model where we had uh, essentially put the beacon so we'd be able to relate it to the actual uh, floor plan. And so when you actually look at the floor plan, um, now we're recognizing that we're near this beacon right here, and we kind of divided it just virtually into three rooms, even though obviously we, I don't know if y'all noticed there are no walls in here. Um, and so what you'll see is uh, we have a blue marker, so uh, obviously we're here. Um, we stop, stop waiting, we're just going to um, let you to uh, explore the, explore the uh, room, and so you can pick up uh, information about the moon. This is what we have pulled out directly from the model, so that's live data. Um, and then you can close that out. We've also included things like uh, issues from EA Docs um, for pictures or whatever might be relevant to the space that you're in. So in this room, we have just one issue and then information about the room. Um, now, let's go ahead and walk over this way, Hala. Very quickly. I think we have three minutes. So now I'm, I should be in this other room. So let me go ahead and just uh, recenter this and say, hey, find my current location. And now we found this other location. And, uh, and we can actually see, of course, room information, which, of course, again, is live. And we actually have two, uh, an RFI and a spec here. And so we can, uh, if there are comments or whatever, these don't actually have comments on them, then we could find more information about that. So essentially what we're doing is we're showing you that you can, f anywhere you go, you just automatically get filtered for you where, where you are in the structure, um, the items and the information that's relevant to you. So now we've, uh, we've gotten to the last room here. And, uh, and I'll go ahead and recenter again. And we will find the latest, the other iBeacon. And now we know that we are in this room. So this is the third room. Um, and of course, again, room information. Um, these actually do have question and answer here. So we get a little bit more information. 
And that's essentially it. So essentially we were able to, uh, what we did find in a lot of this, and I'm just walking around like this is my place. Um, what we found was that, uh, that the beacons were t to some degree inaccurate at times. Um, and so there, and there's also a ton of interference in here because uh, uh, there are a lot of devices in here right now. Um, there are also a lot of Bluetooth devices of all those. Um, so we could definitely tell that there's some interference. When we were able to isolate them outside of this room, it was, a, it was uh, better. Um, but the beacons are not the most uh, mature uh, technology so far. So I think there is some work to do in that, in that area. But, uh, but we were able to, as you see, we were actually able to show you every single spot and, uh, and isolate correctly. So we were, uh, it was actually pretty accurate in this room. Um, I think we have more work to do uh, longer term. Um, but uh, as far as this is concerned, hey, we have 41 seconds, I can say it. Um, we were uh, pushing up uh, that data to Azure to, uh, to get from the cloud. And one of the great things was that uh, I had, when we were doing this, I thought, you know what? Well, this is cross domain. Holla and I were like, oh, wait, I remember the bathroom stall. Um, we actually saw that it's in the bathroom stall, and we, I just thought I'd mention that we actually had to uh, get around across domain, cross origin uh, uh, system. So uh, this is actually awesome. Um, we didn't do it in their way, but, uh, but we, we found a different way around it with JSONP. So that was just awesome. Um, so anyway, thanks, Facebook. And it was in, yeah, and it was in both restrooms, so that was nice. Both restrooms, equal opportunity. <laughs> That's awesome, guys. Really nice work. OK, Judy brought up a point. We didn't applaud them, so let's re give them an applaud. OK, and so uh, yep, the Bentley guys are here. So I need a project file. No, fine. Fine. Or who's after us? Find is after us. I'm sorry, I can't see that project. Project Face, if Project Face can come over here and uh, get on deck. And then, um, yeah, go ahead, take it away, Ben. Good, af good afternoon, I'm Mark Anderson with Bentley, and uh, my uh, Bentley Strategic uh, Technology Projects, and my colleagues Yannick and Eleni joined us for this event. Sorry, I hate microphones. Whenever I teach classes, I always throw the microphone away. Uh, we're doing a project on uh, Object recognition, we felt there's a great need to have the ability for a worker in the field to be able to walk up to some item, look at it with some kind of camera, take a picture, something like that, and be able to then find where that thing exists in their information stores. So we decided that uh, we could leverage some OpenCV technology for doing object recognition and then feed that back into our bread and butter, the microstation stuff and use an eye model to have a, a small piping design in here. So earlier today I sent a picture of my uh, pipe or my valve that I was interested in looking at and uh, l is now going to run that into a little recognizer and somewhere there's a picture there floating down here but it's going through all its recognition trying to see if it can identify this item. And it found it in my piping system, so I could now go back and see where things are at. So what this led us to is actually, while we were here, it generated a, a second, more ambitious idea. The uh, workflow we had first prototyped was a bunch of very static things. I go out and I take a picture send that to somebody, it goes through a process, comes back over. But then uh, my co colleague Yannick saw this and said, you know, we could do this with AR recognition, and it rolled actually into a second project. So I'm going to let him take over on this. All right, so the, for this uh, second part of our project, in fact, uh, we wanted to use uh, Metayo's uh, environment uh, to do some AR uh, because we had a model of uh, this room and uh, we wanted to use it to actually track the position of the user. Uh, at first we wanted to use the new 3D tracking technology of uh, Mitayo, uh, so we kind of uh, uh, 
uh, stripped down this model because we needed a more simple model to extract edges. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, uh, when we uh, used to try to uh, deploy it to our Android device, we had some problem. So we had to fall back on a trying to just use the image-based uh, tracking on our model. Uh, so uh, I'm not sure that this demo will work here because I think we uh, didn't make the test uh, that far from our test uh, image uh, that we have uh, deployed here, but uh, we will uh, try to, uh, to test that uh, right now. Uh, poster to uh, maybe you could uh, move away just a bit because I need all right <laughs> so it doesn't seem to, uh, to work uh, so far uh, probably that uh, I could just uh, unplug this uh, and Maybe a couple of yeah. If you if you uh, unplug it and walk it over here afterwards, and it works, then it counts. All right. But you better move fast, man. That ticker still moves. Yes, actually, it is working. Okay. Uh, here, it's the version of the Meteo image tracking that is uh, not using uh, the sensor of the uh, mobile device, uh, but. With the sensor of the mobile device, you have a more uh, fluid exper uh, experience. And also, uh, for the edge tracking, the, the 3D edge tracking, uh, which they have it uh, really, really right with uh, a mobile device, uh, it, uh, I couldn't make it work uh, that well on, the, on this uh, window, uh, uh, on this window uh, version, uh, because we don't have the sensor to help it because it really needs the sensor to, uh, to work well. But uh, you can see that it, uh, it does work uh, for the uh, image side. And we, ha we use the Revit model, and we have exported uh, through a couple of different uh, uh, um, formats uh, to uh, import that uh, successfully into the Meta.io creator. But, uh, the next step would be to use uh, the full 3D tracking uh, and also the instant tracking. So uh, this is about uh, what we have done uh, on this side as a second part of this project. So uh, this is, uh, yeah. Okay. And I think we're about out of time. So all set. So um, the technologies that uh, we have used in our boot project, uh, we use uh, uh, the image-based recognition. Uh, we train the classifier uh, that is from OpenCV. Uh, and we also use some uh, uh, relevant uh, uh, metadata uh, from the our CAD software microstation. Uh, and uh, we also use the Meta.io creator to, uh, use the, to uh, show the second uh, uh, demo that uh, you've seen, and, al and also for as a open technology that we use, we've used uh, the uh, OpenCV framework with all this uh, its dependencies and uh, uh, Blender also to help us import uh, the model uh, as a final step before uh, putting it in the Metaio creator. So uh, I think that wrapped this up. Awesome, thanks, guys. We need, do we have our next team up on uh, deck? The Alto, I don't, I can't see through people. Oh, Mesh Moon, up on deck, please. Alto Mesh Moon. Oh, awesome. All right, and so uh, up now we have uh, Project, well, yeah, well, Project Face. Wow, what a rush. This is a very cool event. I've been to a lot of conferences and things like that, and I think that if you look around, you look at each other, you're witnessing the democratization, excuse me, this is actually my second language, 
of uh, AAC technology. For the first time in 20 years, I don't feel under the thumb I'm a big software developer. Uh, that being said, our industry has some incredible challenges, and we're going to see if we can uh, do something very small and very simple to try and get us in a direction that might uh, maybe provide a solution. Why don't you go ahead? So just a quick disclaimer. You know, this stuff is uh, experimental. You're, you know, it's all copyrighted. We don't own it. You've, you're, you're all in this with me. We're all going down together. Um, and also, this is, not, uh, this is not death by PowerPoint, so don't worry. So hit it. All right, so our projects are uh, getting easier to do as we go along. Uh, owners are giving us more and more money, and time is unlimited. Um, wait. No, it's the other way around. Um, projects are getting really, really complex, and not any one person has all of the project knowledge, right? So you need some pretty hefty project teams. So why don't you go ahead and let's go next. I had to throw, this is obligatory when talking about BIM, IPDO, any of this stuff. Everybody's seen this slide, right? The earlier you can make decisions, the easier it is, the cheaper it is to make the decisions, and the easier it is to change your mind without taking a whole bunch of, uh, of time and money to do so. Uh, that means bringing even more people earlier on in the process. So you've got tons of knowledge and tons of people early on. So go ahead, let's go next here. We've got this wonderful building information modeling sets of tools and processes that really uh, allow us to look at information in a way that we all can understand and we all uh, can see what the point is that we're all making to one another. These are some great tools, right? Let's go next. This is what BIM looks like. This is the BIM ecosystem. You know, so we hear about silos. The architects doing BIM in their silo. The uh, structural engineers doing BIM in their silo. Well, you know what? The, the developers are doing development in their silo. You know, everybody's got their tool that will take care of RFIs. Great. Another system. Another format. Another thing to learn. Another piece to the ecosystem that is just going to get in the way, quite frankly. So. If what's important about BIM is the information, and we've all heard that at some point, right? It's not the 3D stuff. It's the information that makes it powerful. What that information really looks like, go ahead. That information is not stuff that a project engineer put at the end of a project into um, you know, an Avisworks model and it got hyperlinked. That's not, that's not the information. The information is the knowledge of all these people, what's inside these brains. That's what that information is. And you know, my favorite definition of, uh, of what co collaboration is, you know, and this is for the lawyers in the room, uh, the cooperation with the enemy. You know, and, and we've all gotten a lot better at doing this, but uh, we need to get even better. So it was really frustrating to me, and we saw it earlier. If you attended the uh, digital fabrication presentation, the point was made that, hey, we've got these tools. We do this stuff all day long. We set up road trips with our buddies. We share pictures and video, and everybody gets tagged. Everybody, you know, if you've used Pinterest, man, what an elegant website. You want to store pictures away of stuff? Pinterest is fantastic. Facebook is fantastic. All these things are awesome. So why can't I come to work and do this stuff? I'm doing it at home every single day. Well, maybe you can. Actually, you know what? Go next. That's cooler. It's a lot cooler. A little bit about uh, project phase. We have a truly global team. If you're going to work on collaboration, you got to have a collaborative way of doing it and a collaborative team. So it's truly a uh, global team. We actually had a team of uh, developers in India overnight uh, working on some of the code. And these folks over here, to some degree, came and floated through. It was kind of an ad hoc team. Uh, but we all um, kind of came together and came up with something uh, very simple, but hopefully very useful. Why don't we go next here? So this is what it looks like. You know, it's a news feed. We all, we're all familiar with this. So go ahead. We're using BIM server technology, open source, to import IFC files, which are, again, open source. Why open source? That's very important to stay with the open source theme. Uh, go next. And then using BIM Surfer, again, from the uh, Open BIM Alliance, to bring this stuff into an app widget. Of course, BIM Surfer is kind of in its infancy, and it just got rewritten. So we hit a little bit of a snag, but we've got an alternative. So go ahead and uh, 
I'll, I'll get into the software and show you this stuff. Yeah, it's like it's awesome. All right. So this is the uh, the tool right here. It looks just like you know something you're very familiar with. Uh, you've got your uh, you know you've got your notifications up here. Somebody tagged me on something. Uh, but hey, wait a minute. What what is this? Oh. Look at that. That's a model somebody posted and I got tagged on, and I should probably look at this. Uh, let's go look at it a little bit bigger. This is all using WebGL. Now, this is very, it's very high level. Uh, we haven't done anything too specific because we wanted to have the flexibility to deal with other problems. And so it would be a modular type of environment um, you know, and one of the examples that we decided we do is, you know, how do you get all this digital information out to the field? Um, you know, so I'm actually going to let Vish uh, talk to you about that. Uh, uh, my idea, which I had initially pitched, I thought it's, it would gel very well with uh, what David was doing here, which is connect the digital world to the physical world. So what I did was pretty much like the barcode. Barcode is a pretty good interface that we can have. Uh, you have a physical drawing, you can have a barcode stamped on the drawing. So our drawings are pretty static. It's, no, it's dead. There's nothing coming out of the drawing. But what if we empower it with a barcode that you can transmit to a digital model? So what can be stored in a barcode? The information about the project, the document status, whether it's phys the physical version to the uh, digital version. Is it the, la the most current drawing that you're looking at? If not, can you download it to a screen that you you're looking at? So you have a big screen, like the smart use desktop, and then, but you have a set of drawings that is pretty outdated. So as soon as you scan this barcode, you can go ahead and see the digital version, the latest, most latest version. If you're a job site or in your design office or in an architect's office from the cloud, you can download your latest drawings. Here is an example of somebody actually asking how to take something from a, a barcoded part in a, in a site back to a drawing. So somebody's actually asked this in the world. So he's asking if he has a barcoded part, how can he open a drawing with this a drawing that is associated with that part? So if the drawing had the barcode, you could tie the two together. I just happened to hit upon this QR code generator on Revit's, uh, Autodesk Revit's website, which pretty much you can stamp every drawing with a barcode and you can embed some information which is the URL of the project, the phone numbers of the design teams or whoever, the geolocation of the object, and many other aspects. So go to the next slide, please. So one is smart use team has shown us what they can do with uh, marking up a physical drawing using the Anoto pen. You, you, you've probably seen that presentation. And then there are, they have a sort of a computator. And click next, please. Yeah. They said that I could roll that out with me if I don't show their competitor's uh, presentation. Uh, so most of the time we spend in an office trying to search for information. But instead, if the technology search does the search for us, that's where we should be going. And here is an example of, say, a sample drawing. Oh, uh, you want to do it? Scan that. Oh, the camera is actually somebody doing it. Okay, yeah. just, okay we, just, we just, we are out of time. So he scanned it, and then it pulls up all the drawings. I don't know. It pulls up all the drawings related to that barcode. So he scanned that barcode over there, and it pulled up all the. So we were able to develop the app. The next thing would be to maybe take the barcode to a 3D model and actually associate the objects in that drawing to the uh, 3D model. And then the other thing is, if you have the XYZ coordinates embedded in the barcode or the QR code, you can navigate through infinite number of models. It, it need not be a Revit model, it need not be a Tecla model. If you know the XYZ coordinates of the embedded in that drawing, then you can take it to it through any model, the point cloud, because you're embedded in space, true space. Thank you. Really nice work, guys. Okay, but I guess we're ready to go. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, J.P. Virtanen. 
I'm from uh, Aalto University, a small research unit called MEMO3D, Institute of Measuring and Modeling for the Built Environment. And uh, with me here, I have Ali. Yeah, I'm, I'm Ali Kamarainen from Adminotech, and I'm a software developer. And uh, today we present collaborative virtual environment for present, uh, visualizing laser scanner point clouds. So what we have running here on screen is basically a 3D world. And instead of walking among regular objects, I'm walking in the wider point cloud. And uh, this tries to answer the big problem of how to utilize laser scan data in AEC efficiently. Because laser scanning can be used to uh, quite easily record the environment. But after that, all the modeling steps are really difficult. So by throwing it online and putting it to a virtual system, we can now together start exploring, commenting, discussing, and searching out for problems. Yeah. And uh, Ali gives you a brief overview of how the technically this thing goes. So, yeah. So, MeshMoon, MeshMoon is a virtual world platform, and it's cloud-based and on-demand. So instead, instead of like Second Life, there's not, not a huge world, persistent world going on 24-7, but all the servers and vir virtual worlds are kind of like ad hoc or on-demand. So when a user joins, the server is brought up and the world is live, and when all the users leave, the server shut do shuts down. And users can join worlds with native Windows or OS X clients, or now we have also this brand new web browser-based WebRocket client. Do you have anything to add? We can continue, we've got time. And uh, so, as you see it now, it's now running on a laptop. Uh, and Ali already mentioned we can also run it via browser. We have an Oculus Rift version also over there, so after the presentations, you're free to feel free to come over and try it out. And uh, basically, what this hack is about is taking the LiDAR data and figuring out how to convert it into a format that we can run it in the system. So that's the, that, that, that's the problems that we've been solving here. And uh, Ali is now displaying some of the tools we already have in the MeshMoon virtual reality. So we've got chat, we've got VoIP. At the moment, there's no one else online. If there would be more people, we'd see more avatars. We can also do uh, kind of like what were prims in Second Life, so start adding simple objects there. We can start annotating. Okay, so Ali is trying to get online so we could probably see if this works or if we have a demo effect. Today's been a bad day with networks. <laughs> but, okay, so it has crashed. Well, the, and how this moves on, the idea is not just putting LiDAR point clouds online. The idea is starting to combine them with, for example, building models, IFC models, other data. So this could, in theory, make like getting an overview of a construction project, overview of a renovation project, much easier than it currently is by bringing all the data into the same platform and visualizing it as needed. So I guess that's our key points. We are Surprisingly finishing almost two minutes ahead of schedule. So, thank you. Is there a clicker or you just yeah. have to go through a manual one? Check, check. Good. Cool. All right, I bacon team, you're up. Well, my name is Chase Clark and I'm with Balfour Beatty Construction and uh, we are iBacon. We don't know why we chose that name. My name is Evan, and I did the UX UI portion of this. 
Hey, Chris Casale. Siemens. It's real formal. So I do want to thank everybody here that I've uh, had the opportunity to talk to. This was, um, it was pretty interesting to not only hack technology, but hack the way um, construction companies work in our own silos, and we think we have ideas about how stuff should work, and then we come and meet Siemens, and then we learn a whole lot more about what types of things um, we should be considering before just rolling out some kind of technology idea we have. And so the idea of just hacking the thought process was pretty, pretty interesting. But our problem we wanted to work through was indoor positioning. We know how to link to data. We know how to work with models. And we know what kind of information we want. But the problem we've had with this location-based technology is actually figuring out where we really are in the building because GPS sucks. Sorry for the, the honesty there. Um, so what we got here, if you look at the screen, is we wanted to figure out indoor positioning first. The other things were things that we, uh, we wanted to use as an example to test that out. So it's not perfect. The, the technology we're working with, like the, the other Beacon group said, is, is a still in development. But we, we learned a whole lot from it. And hopefully from what we learned, we can roll out to everybody else and there can be some um, further development. So the technology, I'm going to speak to the lowest person in here, so the people who know what beacons are. Um, you can just stop listening for a second. Basically, what we wanted to use is Bluetooth low energy beacons. They are things that are built in everybody's iPhone, the latest Android devices, and they're not the Bluetooth that everybody's familiar with that kills your battery, that connects to your headset. It's, um, it's something that we can use now intelligently to, if we walk up to a piece of hardware, use it to authenticate with that and it, without logging in manually. We can use it to find out where we are in a building. We can use it to say, all right, look, I'm next to this thing here, and as soon as I get within a certain range, I can now have a trigger happen because I'm close to that object. And that's critical because one, we can do things indoors, in the basement of a building, um, in a remote, in a remote uh, job site. So just understanding that the technology is, is new, um, but Beacons is a core focus. Um, all right. So, That's for right. um, so we'll walk through like a hypothetical scenario. If we're picturing someone who's, like, say, new to a facility, so we use this room as kind of the, the template. So this worker would get a work order on his iPad. He'd be able to see exactly what's going on, where he needs to go. Um, so he's able to see the description of what's going on. Someone's complaining about an issue in a building. I guess it's too cold in the building. So he's able to walk to that, see the recent activity, accept this work order, and then that gets uploaded to um, the, the database server. So his manager is able to see it, as well as his colleagues, to make sure it's in, in compliance and being worked on. He moves to it, he uses augmented reality to kind of see the room, and you'll see that that black dot has a one, that's an indicator of where he needs to go to see which ceiling tile he needs to pump, um, punch through to actually, actually access what he needs to work on. As he gets closer, he, um, the, I guess the application will automatically show him different schematics of what he's going to be interfacing with and interacting with. He's able to pick and pull which one he wants to use, so he'll choose the, the top right um, schematic. As he sees that, he'll see indicators that say like one or two, indicating which tools to use for that. But in this scenario, he also has access to service histories. And the, it's a smart, intelligent software. So it's telling him in the bottom right that records show that there's a, a dependency failure based on a circuit breaker. That is the core issue of why this part is actually failing or registering as failing. So he's able to realize that it's actually not this part, but he needs to go somewhere else to fix it. And that's validated a second time by his coworker in the bottom um, right telling him the same thing. So he decides not even to go into the service panel, but move to the circuit breaker. Um, again, using augmented reality, he's able to see which breaker it is, pull that breaker. Um, the system lets him know what parts needed. Um, and then he's able to request the part in the bottom right hand corner. So he does so. And then in a few minutes, um, one of his coworkers brings the part. Um, then he's able to finish up the work order and put that back into the system to create, again, a history record. So as uh, work goes forward, they're able to better diagnose their systems within the buildings. 
Okay, so let's look at some real um, application here. If you could switch to the iPad, please. Okay, so what we have is we have a couple beacons around the room. Um, right now we're in the room. We don't necessarily know exactly where we're at if, if you want to come up. Rather than me going to the beacon, the beacon's going to come to me just because I'm tethered here. So one of the things I can do is I can look at the room and I can see um, a, a virtual or a, you know, a, a, the model of the room and I can see there's a problem with one of the VAV boxes. Um, when I get to the room, uh, as I come close to the beacon, it automatically detects that I'm within a certain range of the beacon and it will switch screens automatically for me. Yeah. Fun. Let me try this real quick. Yeah. Today's a demo fun day, I guess. Let's, let's try that again. Okay, so it detects that I'm within range of the beacon and it switches to my work order. I'm then able to go and look at the virtual box that I'm underneath and I can see the model and I can see building automation information overlaid on top of that model. And if I want to try to over, override one of the valves, maybe I was cold in that room and I could see my valve is at 10 and I want to test it to make sure the valve's working right, I can command it to 100 and I can do that live. So I'm able to bring together beacon technology, building information modeling, building automation system all to the user uh, real time. So, thank you. Awesome. Thanks a lot, guys. Hello, my name is Curtis Rogers. I'm with McCarthy Construction. Hi, I'm Anubhav Singh. Uh, I'm a software developer. Oh. Once we get plugged in here. So our team name, uh, we didn't get very creative with this. High Value Asset Shared Inventory H Vasi. That's what we're calling it. We're going to stick with that. And, and these are the members of our team. We have uh, one member who isn't uh, present, but we definitely appreciate your help. Uh, how we came together, uh, we met here at the hackathon. So I think it's really cool that I can come here with knowledge about problems in the industry and then meet somebody who's never even thought about building a tool for the construction industry and go from no understanding to working on a problem. So the problem we're trying to solve is a, a simple tool to keep track of inventory. So this isn't a Google spread, or, uh, this isn't a spreadsheet where the uh, survey manager or the, the inspector uh, goes back to their spreadsheet and keeps track of the inventory after you know making markups on their notepad. This is a mobile app where they can easily add items to their inventory and then they will have visibility into other projects inventory in order to have the benefit of avoiding unnecessary purchases. So the situation would be um, I need a new concrete uh, density testing device. They're very expensive and instead of making the purchase of a new one at project startup I can very easily see what the other projects in my company uh, have available. Okay, and the tech and open source. I'm just going to turn it over for uh, for the demo. Can we swap to the MacBook. Uh, so this is a very simple app that we came up with. So here you have the project name. Uh, the, uh, so we have just j made it very generic that whichever project guys are working, so they will be logging in with the project name. And then suppose uh, you enter the project one. So uh, then this is the inventory that is currently being held by project one. So these are the four items that are there in the inventories for which uh, we have three items are owned by project one and one item was owned by uh, project three but it is currently being leased by project one. So when you uh, suppose I want to request for a, um, uh, I mean, uh, if, I, if the project one b buys some other item, he can just go here and add that particular item. Uh, suppose the uh, there is some, other item that is being required, suppose uh, you need a rebar cutter, so you can just 
search for that rebar cutter, which other projects have that rebar cutter. And yeah, so uh, currently we can see that project two and project three are owning the rebar cutter. So project one can just go and reserve that particular item and that will be reserved by uh, project one. And it you can see that it's being owned by project two. It's a very simple UI that we came up with. Yeah, so we could add things to this, uh, photos, unique identifiers, barcode scan, all of that, but really it's helping projects have shared inventories and super, super simple. So mobile web page or potentially an app, and that's our problem and solution. Thank you. Okay, uh, we're digital reality. Uh, Christopher, Dave, Don's not here. Uh, Don was here yesterday, but he had to go back to Monterey because, well, it's nice there, and so why not? Um, this presentation will be very short. Uh, I'm going to talk about the big problem. It's nice that you have uh, all this information in BIM, uh, but our objects are actually getting more sophisticated, and the Internet of Things is kicking into place, as we see with the lights and with the uh, window uh, uh, shade there. And what I expect to see happening is information about an object and its capabilities, as well as its addressability, will be within the BIM itself. So the big issue I was looking at is like, okay, if I have a window coming in and I know information about it, as far as it can go up and down, it has a, a URL address, so forth, uh, how can I interact with it? And then how can I interact with it in a hands-free way? And what really got me thinking about this is we were actually talking about some other projects. You know, imagine you had a false soffit over here, and I want to walk around and I want to start looking at things and maybe start interacting with it. I can't really have, have an iPad like this all day trying to look at stuff because my arms get tired and I can't write anything. It's kind of ridiculous. I should be able to just wave my hand and make things happen. So the first problem I have to solve is the motion sensor to interact with information that's coming from uh, the BIM. So to do this, we need a BIM server, got that, thank you. <laughs> well, leap motion, so this is a little uh, leap motion detection device here, connected in. And then we have the software, HTML5, uh, smart window API, thank you Berkeley for that. And then a, a 3D model, Revit, uh, and 3D Studio. And then what will happen is, obviously to start out, is you have your... Uh, your information in uh, the, the model coming out from the BIM server saying, this window has a shade on it, it has a motor, here are the various APIs to talk to it, and here are the various capabilities for it. So like, okay, well once I get that model and I have that information, then I want to start acting on it. And so here we see, or do we see? It's not projecting up. How do I? That's strange. I don't know, how do we get this part to show on the screen? To uh, web browsers. Okay, so while that's going, I'll talk further about the issue. So the real cool use case is that, um, imagine you're, you have uh, uh, AR goggles on, and then you have a little motion sensor here. So you can be walking around a room, you can actually use gesture commands to interact with all the devices in the environment, or so for example, if you're a construction manager and you need to verify that something was installed correctly, you can actually look at the device, go click like that, and it verifies that the object's where it's supposed to be. So I thought, well, that's cool. So let's actually build it. And so we decided to build it. So what we have here is, I tried connecting to that thing, but because of the way the network's set up and the fact that the uh, BIM server has to be accessible, and then some other things for the X3D has to be accessible. I actually connected with Berkeley directly. So this is actually a live connection to Berkeley Labs. So I'm going to refresh that, make sure I got the latest API telling me the state of the window. Well, our internet's been disconnected? What's going on? Why don't we have internet anymore? Because you're doing a demo. Oh, well, thank you. All right, well, that really bug me if this doesn't work because it's been working great. So we have our 3D model. 
and I have a state which says ready. So if I want to, so I already know the model's telling me that this window has this capability, so I can actually have a motion and decide to open the window. And because of the internet, thank you kindly, this should be raising up. Oh, it's still trying to connect to Berkeley, that's why. Well, thank you, internet connection. Well, normally, if the internet connection was working properly, the window in Berkeley would actually raise and lower based on the motion commands that I'm providing here. But as you can see, the connection is not very good. Let me try. You got two minutes to figure it out, Chris. Oh, there's, not, there's no figuring it out. I already know what the problem is. It's not connecting. It's just an internet problem. Just. So basically, it simply is not able to connect outside. Well, you can chat a little bit about the BIM. I'm going to just keep waiting on this thing. Right. Uh, well, I uh, used a slightly older version of the BIM server stuff because it already had a, a web browser interface on it, and I modified the old Colada, the Colada exporter for that to export X3D instead, along with more information about the model, including unique identifiers and so forth that was being lost otherwise in the Colada export. Uh, and I'm not sure it was made clear, but that picture of the window that he had up a little while ago is not a picture of the window. It is a 3D model, live 3D model uh, in the X3D viewer known as X3 DOM. And so we're able to reach into that um, with the browser using standard HTML style DOM uh, JavaScripting to um, outfit the model with uh, the leap sensor. Okay, so I think what happened is Berkeley turned it off. Go Bears! Uh, and I'm a Berkeley grad too. What's up with you guys? Um, the real, and so the big idea with this is that by, and then the code itself for the leap sensor isn't, the way I'm writing the libraries is it should be able to work with anything. You can use a connect, or you can use whatever you want to use. And what I really see as the future going on is that as we get more and more interconnected things within our built environment, we're going to want to interact with them more. But just using iPads and holding things up like that is not going to be an option. We're going to have glasses. We're going to have AR systems. And the only way we're going to be able to interact with things is we're going to have to use gesture controls. So not only is this a proof for right now to work at this hack, which a lot of people seem it does work, I'm actually going to donate this code. You got the, you got the window. That's a different feed. That's a different feed? But the problem is the, the URL call I'm using to open and close is still using that address. Well, hang on. If, uh, is this an override? Does it have override in it? Yeah. Top right? Top oh. left, okay. Oh, you guys got lucky because you're the last presentation. Time, time is out. <laughs> oh, here's override. So imagine that happened. <laughs> So if, if I had this URL in this statement here, it would work. But according to the rules, I'm not allowed to actually change one stupid line in my program. But essentially, if this was a different line, actually with that URL, then the gesture controls would be working, and then everything would be great, and we'd be happy. And then here's some other cool things. I can go left, and I can go right, and I can open and close, and there's all kinds of cool things I can do. There you go. Yay. Happy. <laughs> well done, sir. So, yeah, guys, uh, you know, wrapping it up, um, just uh, let's see here. I want to make sure that we stick with the uh, schedule. Let's move up a little bit. Okay. So, um, it was uh, very difficult to judge this, to be quite honest. Um, everybody uh, had some amazing stuff. I am going to ask for everybody's attention, so if you want to have a conversation, take it outside. Burn! Okay, so, um, all right, so, again, amazing stuff. Um, but uh, unlike last time, where everyone was a winner, this time we actually have winners. So, um, and, and again, I mean, uh, before we even get started on this, if I could just get everyone seriously, you guys saw what this was, so at least these people deserve one more round of applause, please.
And 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 seriously, this is very impressive because uh, just a real quick show of hands. Uh, how many people in here have a computer science background? Okay. How many are from the industry? A zero. Okay. Yeah. All right. So for those that can't see, that was like a one to two thirds type deal. So for all you guys who came, um, that was awesome. Okay. <laughs> really awesome. Um, so so the winners that we have. Um, and again, and this was uh, participation from, from judges that were here and then also uh, not here, but were able to see it. Um, so the first one up um, is the uh, BIM server uh, category. And, and so uh, the group that was with hands free, or the window, the you guys um, who aren't in here. Okay, they got number one. Okay, and then the... Uh, Number two prize goes to Project Face. So if the Project Face guys are, where are they? Here? All right, and so uh, make sure you find me afterwards and, and we'll do that, okay. Um, and then next up, uh, we had uh, Matayo and uh, their license and that prize went to the team from Bentley. Where are those guys? Okay. Okay, and then um, the next uh, group, um, that was the uh, Balfour uh, Betty, and they were actually excluded from this, even though it was their thing. Um, but uh, uh, the second, second uh, runner-up is I Bacon. And then uh, the winner of that hack is I Beacon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, a lot of a lot of eyes there. Uh, who makes that device? And and then um, and then next up, and then this is what was really cool uh, is 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 our categories. Um, so uh, we we really um, had had three that that I mean again all of them were awesome. That's why it was very difficult, and we were in there for so long. Um, uh, third runner up um, for the hackathon uh, prize of ours is uh, Project Face. Okay. And um, since it's always cool when you can do this, come get it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> he moved fast. All right. Yeah. Not paid attention to that. Awesome, Thank man. Hey, good Project job. Project Opportunity, come on. Ah, uh, oh, hug. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and then um, the the number two prize. I guess y'all get more prepped if I did this first, right? So, um, so, so that was a, a, a one hundred dollar prize. Uh, the next one is a two hundred and fifty dollar prize. I hope, um, and uh, that goes to Hack E, the team of Hack E. Yeah, exactly. And then um, the uh, number one winner of our prize, which was $350. Yeah, okay, yeah, $350 first prize um, uh, goes to drum roll. Uh, oh, thank you, thank you, guys. Y'all are awesome. Of course, the guy from Louisiana. Anyway, so, uh, anyways, uh, hack my hard hat. That was the uh, number one. Where? Now, of course, if they left, then that goes. Oh, there, here we go. Right on. I like this song. Yeah, I know, right? Good deal, man. Okay, so um, yeah, I mean, awesome job, everybody, uh, on the judging there, and and then uh, let's see, do we have we do have our sponsors in the house? So um, a real big uh, round of applause, please, uh, just just to, to let you guys know. I mean, to to make this happen, there's a lot of folk that were involved. I mean, um, I would definitely like to point out that uh, from the last event, 
uh, we had some people who stepped up to the challenge. Um, just to point out, uh, Miss Christine uh, Frederico, of course, was was awesome. Yes, please. Um, Curtis Curtis Rogers as well was awesome. Dustin, who was uh, new to the team, but definitely uh, helped out. And then um, Miss Waffa, yeah, and then Miss Waffa, who um, is not here, is the reason why we ate. So next time you see her. Uh, and you can tell that it was not our selection because it would have been pepperoni or cheese, not quiche. So, um, and, uh, and then definitely, um, you know, uh, the, the guys that sat on that call, there's so many of y'all that run behind the scenes outside of that. I just personally want to give you all a big thank you. Um, it saved me a lot of stress. So um, thanks again. And then also to our sponsors. Um, and, and again, a very special thank you to you guys. This is the first time that we uh, actually had the opportunity to give away cash prizes. And that's mainly because of y'all and, and things like that and to help out. So thank you there. So definitely um, a big shout out to um, Ignite, uh, Balfour Betty, Walter P. Moore, Smart Use, um, EM8S, uh, you know, Quimby Heavy Industries, Building Connected, of course, uh, Harold Remodeling, Matayo, and then all the people up there on, on the website. And, and then also a big shout out to our media partners that helped us get the word out, um, such as, you know, the Marketer Project, Wiley, the DFAB Net, and then a bunch of other great organizations. So um, a big round of applause, please, for our sponsors and media people. And, and then, yeah, and then so um, pretty much uh, this, this wraps everything up. And so, um, you know, all I can say is please post everything that you worked on or something like that. Share it with the uh, Facebook page. Share it with the Facebook group. Um, and, and again, this is y'all event. This is the community. So don't look to us to have another event or to keep this going. Uh, use, use those channels, right? Communicate. Let's see what we can move beyond here. And the next time that we do this, we hope that some of you guys are in a position to where maybe you're, you're a little bit further along with your product, which if you are, we'd love then to help bring in the people that are appropriate to help you with that. So it's kind of one of those things that the um, community, as the community grows, we definitely want to be there to make sure that there are awesome people like y'all in this room that are going to help. Um, just so you know also, and this is a shout out because I promised I told him I would, we will try to strive to have energy and policy people here also. Um, I know AEC kind of restricts it and we did get a lot of questions from people this time of are you going to have facilities people or things like that. So if anyone in this room can help us spread the word to get all the people that are really involved with the built environment to be here next time, please help us out. Um, other than that guys, uh, yes, uh, one question. Mm. As all of you encounter folks, uh, it, you know, businesses that may have a, a, something they want to get solved, tell them to put a thousand bucks or ten thousand bucks in and sponsor a hack, and you know, they can award the prize money. But we want to get some more yeah. business possible to bring in more technologists in here too. Yeah. So, so thank you for bringing that up. Uh, Steve, so that is that is another thing about how hackathons normally go down, right? I mean, it is people solving problems, but um, it, what was nice to see this time is that there were some actual industry buy-in where they said, hey, look, this is what we kind of want you to work on. So, um, and, and we had some really great representation throughout the couple of days. I don't, I'm sure you guys got a chance to talk to a lot of people, but I don't know if you ask them so who do you represent which is kind of cool that some people didn't right so um but uh yeah so if there is a specific problem that you know that your company is is facing or, or trying to y'all probably don't have that problem alone right and so if everybody can ante in a little bit then we can use this as a really great opportunity to solve problems to really move everyone forward in the industry and then also reward some great talent so i'm just going to just for a few uh minutes open it up to um any comments now, of course, I will say this. If you have a comment for the next hackathon, you just became the captain of that ship, okay? So, other than that, um, any comments, questions? Okay, uh, then, then, then I have some. Um, how many people in here had a good time this weekend? Okay, awesome, awesome. And, and, and how many of you guys, um, I, know, I know a lot of y'all actually came from not around here but how many would love to participate in another one? Okay, fucking awesome. All right, you guys are great. Um, all right, well, well, folks, if nothing else, I know that uh, Facebook has been nice enough to um, just uh, let us hang out here probably for about uh, another hour 
um, which I'm going to say 45 minutes because it always takes 20 to get everybody out. But um, at 5:30, uh, we we do need to leave, and then um, and and a biggest round of applause for Spencer, Eric, all the guys who ran the AV Facebook. I mean, okay. You you guys made the event possible. They helped even allow it to be conceivable because they provided us this space, right? So, I mean, um, a big thanks, seriously, guys, for y'all coming in on the weekend and everything like that and helping us out. And Spencer's not in here. But, um, yeah, so hu hug you. Oh, there he is. Oh, okay, awesome. Uh, Spencer, please, man. I hate to put you on the spot. But the guy in the hat, just a round of applause for him. Then for, yeah. This is Lubna right here. Okay, so a hackathon on the East Coast, and that is uh, going down. Yeah. So, um, if, if there are people that want to help participate, that's that's the the, the lady. Possibly July. Talking. I'm sorry. July or so, sometime this summer. Okay, then um, then we'll see. Uh, tentative. Um, and then uh, anything else? All right. Uh, oh, we have. Oh well, thank you, Beasley. Thank you, Damon. I'll give you that five bucks later. Oh yeah, that, that that guy was awesome. Okay, so so then just a real quick uh, question, uh, then for for Spencer. Spencer, is there a problem with having people that are under eighteen here if they're not with a parent? Okay, should be should should being the word there. Okay, okay. So so great great call. And and then I mean, would you guys be cool with like uh, not necessarily an amateur hack because those guys are awesome, but like a younger person hack or a student hack? Is that everybody think that'd be pretty neat to have? That okay, cool. Um, and then also help us reach out to the tech community, right? Um, I mean, we had some really amazing stuff here. I know that there were some people that were going to try to come down with more drones than that awesome little one that you guys were flying around yesterday. So, um, so yeah. So, any other uh, comments? Oh, yeah, yep, yep. Um, we will definitely get more universities, and and then uh, since we're getting more universities, we need volunteers to pay for those universities, probably to fly out here. So, if anyone's got like extra money that they want to help the universities come out and participate, awesome. And and we will definitely. Um, like to do that as, as you've kind of seen from last time we've we've added more to our schedule this time last uh sunday we didn't have anything going on so we're definitely trying to um embrace more people and again if there's parts of the built environment that we left out please just come to us and let us know but other than that guys y'all were freaking awesome thank you very much and we'll see you next time thanks